My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Cannon, and, and um, uh, this is how you might want to uh, track me down. Uh, so as uh, Paul mentioned, I uh, spent 30 years uh, with Deloitte. Uh, I left Deloitte in uh, January, uh, sorry, in end of May of last year. I write a, a weekly article series uh, called uh, Digital Oil and Gas uh, on my uh, blog site. My blog site uh, is called jeffreycan.com if you want to uh, track it down. Uh, and uh, subscribe. I can't sign you up under GDPR laws. You got to sign yourselves up, fortunate, unfortunately. If you give me a business card, though, I'll send you an email to say, hey, would you like to sign up? And then I'll directly send you the link. And that way you can sign up. But I'm not allowed to sign you up uh, directly. Uh, so what I do these days is I advise organizations around the world now uh, around uh, the impact of digital and oil and gas. I'm going to Kuwait in two weeks. I'm in Madrid in January, London in February. Uh, this in South Korea earlier. Uh, this is a hot topic around the world, uh, this question of digital change in oil and gas. So let there be no mistake, let there be no doubt, this is a foot race. Country companies and countries around the world are staring at this problem with intensity to try and figure out what it is that they're going to do to take advantage of the innovations that are coming. Now, I want to talk about why it feels a little different this time. Why is this feeling a little different? There's R2-D2 and C-3PO. For those of a certain age, I was at a Starbucks the other day <laughs> ordering coffee, and the young woman said, so what name do I give? And I said, Darth Vader. And she said, can you spell that? <laughs> like, who the hell doesn't know who Darth Vader is? <laughs> so it's a millennial generation. Anyway, I showed her these icons. She wouldn't know who these two, these two characters are. Show of hands if you know who they are. Yes, yeah, you all know who they are. Of course they are. Here's the issue with digital. Digital is very democratic. Democratic means anyone can buy it, install it, adopt it, and put it to work. So in years, our most recent innovation in oil and gas was uh, fracking, fracking and horizontal drilling. That's what unlocked all of the treasure that's caused the, the challenges uh, in, in uh, global uh, pricing. And uh, was fracking available to the finance industry? No. How about healthcare? Nope. What about agriculture? Nope. What about artificial intelligence? Is that available to us? Yes, it is. Is it available to agriculture, finance, public sector? Yes, it is. It's very democratic. These technologies don't respect industrial boundaries. All industries are impacted. Certain kinds of untouchable jobs. My, my sister was uh, laid off from her uh, rather nice job. She'd held it for 30 years, first with uh, Shell and then with CNRL, uh, in document control. You know why? Robots took the job. And so privileged white collar jobs are going to disappear because of this wave of technology uh, coming at us. $250 billion is flowing into trying to figure out how the next wave of uh, technology will impact cars. And we might laugh about Tesla and so forth, but Tesla's cars now run 18,000 miles apiece before someone has to put their hands on the wheels. Right? 18,000 miles before someone has to actually put their hand on the wheels. Do you know what the number is for BMW? 4.6 miles. Do you know what it is for Daimler? 1.2. The Germans are way behind. Billions and billions of dollars are flowing into these industries to try and figure this stuff out. Though you can see all the building blocks starting to come into place. Think about 5G and Huawei and, and, and uh, the, all the impact that the arrest has had uh, in Vancouver of the CFO. Why is that such a, so important? Because that's the kind of building block technology that starts to unlock what feels different this time. 3D printing doesn't really have much of an effect on us here in oil and gas, but let me give you some, just some stats. 10 years ago, the fastest 3D printer cost $15,000. It was also the cheapest because it was the only one. Fast and cheap, $15,000. Today, any of us can buy the cheapest available uh, 3D printer. It only costs 400 bucks and it's 100 times faster. Right? 3D printing is on this cost decline productivity gain curve uh, that is going to come to the manufacturing industry. And once the manufacturers figure this out, they're going to start trying to figure out how do I 3D print what I need rather than shipping it around the world and manufacturing it. So 3D printing is coming. It's coming fast. It's going to be very upsetting to manufacturing and logistics and, and so forth all around the world. 
very democratic technology. Blockchain technology, another good one. Blockchain creates trust. As we add sensors around the, uh, to all of our devices out there, are we gonna have Ford to send Joey out to check every sensor to make sure it hasn't been hacked? The software's still correct? No, we're not. We're gonna wire the software so that it talks to the cloud to get the latest software update. Then we're gonna make sure that no one's tampered with that sensor and we're gonna use blockchain to do that. That's the purpose of that technology. It's still very junior, very new, but it's coming. It's coming. Now let's talk a little bit about bots, these characters. Why are they so interesting? Bots are so efficient, they're banned on social media platforms. Think about that, they're banned. I had a LinkedIn profile, uh, all of you, all, everybody here on LinkedIn, I'm just gonna assume you all are, you're in the sort of digital world, right? How many contacts do you have? And have you ever thought of calling your contacts? Uh, I, I called my contacts when I uh, left uh, Deloitte. I had 5,000 Australian contacts on there. Why would I have 5,000 Australian contacts on my contact list? So I set out to remove all the contacts uh, from LinkedIn uh, for the, the people lived in Australia. You know how you have to do that? You have to move the mouse manually to each one. There's no bulk way to get rid of them. So using uh, uh, Upwork, I contracted with a software developer in South Africa for, for all of $40, and he built me a bot. And I plugged my bot onto my laptop, I fed it the 200 names and said, delete these names. And the bot, I told him, be careful, program the bot so it looks like a hand's moving it. Like I don't want the same pattern repeated. So he introduced random hand movements into it and so forth. And then he ran the bot. First 60, no problem. I said, oh, well the limit's not 60, let's try 120. 120, no problem. Oh, it's not 120, let's try 240. Boom, at 200, LinkedIn canceled my account. Email note, we think you're using a bot. Those are not permitted on our platform. You use bots on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, you get booted off. Think about that. This is a technology so efficient. The digital leaders ban its use. Now, I gotta ask you, if you're not using this technology in your operations today, Give your head a shake. Like this is this is like kryptonite uh, to the to the digital world. We should be shoving it into our businesses as fast as we possibly can. That's how powerful this stuff is. So it feels different. The bots are coming, but we're not getting it right. Would you trust that bot? I wouldn't trust that bot. Originally, the first time I drew that cartoon, by the way, all the cartoons are mine. I, I, um, I'm, I'm deathly afraid of lawsuits. And so rather than scraping uh, images off of the internet, I hand draw all my artwork. Uh, so this saves me uh, lawsuit issues. Um, uh, so I drew this one. Originally drew it as a robot shooting a, a apple off the woman, uh, a head of a woman. And I quickly took it down because that is, uh, perpetuates violence against women. And I'm um, a key believer that uh, violence against women is a, is a non-starter in our society. So there you go. I got it wrong the first time, but I got it right the second time. So I'm shooting the apple off the guy's head. We're not getting it right. Let me give you some evidence to just tell you this. I talk to uh, tech startups all the time and they tell me, I'm trapped in pilot project hell, I can't get out. Why are there no digital unicorns serving oil and gas? Right, why is that? Why are there digital unicorns in virtually every other industry? Transportation, hotel, foods, cannabis of all things. And yet we haven't got any digital unicorns in the oil and gas industry, why is that? Not quite getting it right. How come there are no digitally branded oil and gas companies? Name a single oil and gas company anywhere in any field, upstream, midstream, downstream, that says our differentiation. We are first and foremost a digital company and our product happens to be oil. Pizza companies now call themselves digital companies. Our product happens to be pizza. 15 years ago, FedEx said, we're a digital company. Our product happens to be moving packages around. Where's the digital company that brands itself uh, in this way in the oil and gas industry? Adoption rates, really, really slow in this industry. There's good reasons for that, right? You want to be safe and secure and so forth. We need reliability. You can't put stuff into the field that does not work. That's just not going to happen. But bits and, bits and bytes and so forth allow us to uh, trial things at, at speeds and paces that are far faster than we've ever uh, had a chance to experience in the past. But the adoption rate's still really, really slow. Take bots, for example. You know, when bots were invented, they're banned on social media. When were they invented? 15 years ago. They're invented in the gaming industry. Any of you with uh, children who play games? Yeah, a few of you? Ask them tonight. 
Have you seen any tools on any of those gaming platforms where you can have an avatar run around and collect armor, collect treasure, uh, pay your tolls and your fines and your fees? Just ask them. And they'll tell you, of course, Dad, Mom, duh. That's how you do things on those platforms. Banned on social media. Very, very slow to adopt that kind of technology in our industry. These killer solutions sit on the sidelines for some reason. There's a very, very high failure rate of digital startups. It's about 1%. 1% is the success rate. 99% fail. The success rate for digital innovations goes up to 30% if someone in industry gets very directive and says, that's the problem I'm trying to solve. Stop solving the problems you think I have. Solve the problem I actually have. Success rate goes up to 30%. How many of you have some vendor knocking on your door saying, hey, I want to talk to you about a solution and to help get, it'll, it'll give you lots of value. Sure, I promise. And you're not hands-on trying to make sure that's actually dialed into the problem you've got. Kind of let them go off on their own. Not a good, not a good strategy. Last but not least, I want to highlight talent. I presented to the Young Pipeliners Association of Canada a couple of weeks ago at YPAC. And um, publicly, these are all young people, 35 and under. That's the rule you have to get in. I felt like dad talking to my kids. So I'm on stage talking to my kids. And um, uh, they came up to me afterwards and they said, I'm really thinking of getting out of this industry. I'm so tired. I'm constantly asking my boss for permission to do something. I can't trial this. I know this is a better way to do this. They always say no. Can you help me? What should I do? What should I do? If we don't start to look at this problem through the lens of the next generation, uh, talent is going to start to avoid this industry. We don't need a Greta Thunberg, frankly. We don't need a Greta Thunberg on the, on the steps of legislatures telling us and telling next generation young, youngsters, you don't work in, a, in an industry that isn't a, a attractive from an environmental standpoint. I tell you right now, <laughs> you go and do a poll of the 35 and unders in your oil and gas company today, and they'll tell you the acceptance of good ideas, my ideas, digital ideas into this business is really low, really low, particularly pipelines. I don't know about the rest of the industry, but pipelines, absolutely true. So we're not getting it right. From the research of writing the book, I wanted to just share with you um, why this is a culture change problem. It's not a technology problem. Number one, boards and management teams don't really understand yet the opportunity, and they don't understand the threat. The opportunity and the threat. It's a dual-edged sword. The opportunity is actually fantastic. A technology so good, it's banned on social media. What could you do with that inside this industry? So data intense, so work intense. We don't really understand why this is a, an opportunity and a threat. Number two, we have a whole bunch of embedded incentives that keep the status quo deeply, deeply in place. And so if you want to unlock some creativity in the industry, one of the things we've got to do is change the incentive structures. A really good example, out in the field, supervisors and field assets are paid to keep the assets running 24-7 to a high level of reliability and a high level of safety. How does that encourage someone to come in and say, I think I might have a better way of doing it? It doesn't, the incentive structures are set up such that it makes it hard for a change to come into the, into the uh, business uh, environment. Number three, water waterfall work processes. In the digital world, digital people are going after two laws, right? Law number one is Moore's law. Moore's law says that per unit time, the density of transistors on a circuit trip will double and they will have in cost. So constantly falling co um, uh, pro cost and constantly rising capability. If you're a Silicon Valley startup, you plan for that. You plan that whatever you're doing today, 18 months from now, whatever you're doing today is going to be half the cost and twice as capable. We don't do this in oil and gas. When we engineer something to work, we engineer it to work to the parameters set at the time it was set to work. We don't plan to upgrade it. We don't plan to patch it. We don't plan to take advantage of new technologies. Silicon Valley doesn't do it that way. They say, we need to be thinking about how to do that. Democratic technologies force you to confront Gordon, Mr. Moore. The second law is Metcalf's law, the law of networks. I have a cell phone and, what's your name, please? Very well, visita. 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 Can't quite hear. I'm going to call you Viz for short. Okay? All right. So Viz and I have phones. How many connections do we have? One. What's your name? Teresa. Teresa. No, Teresa joins um, the network that Viz and I have just set up. How many, how many connections are there now? 
Well, I can talk to Viz. I can talk to Teresa. Teresa can talk to Viz. I got three connections. What happens if I ask Ed, uh, what's your name? Bill. Bill. Let's add Bill. Now I've got four. How many connections are there now? Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, six seven, eight. Metcalf says the value of a network goes up by a square of the number of nodes you add on the network. Why does Mr. Tesla make all his cars talk to one another? Because Metcalf's law says that if you can connect up all of the assets in a network, you create value, enormous amounts of value. We have lots and lots of oil and gas assets. They don't talk to one another. One of our challenges in oil and gas is the work process called waterfall. We fix something and then we take it to the next stage and we fix it. We take it to the next stage and we fix it. In the Silicon Valley world, the waterfall process does not work. What you do there is you, 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 time, you time box your work. You say, 90 days from now, I'm going to deliver this. Another 90 days, I'm going to deliver this. Next 90 days, deliver this. You box it by time, not by scope. Different ways of thinking, different ways of working. Number four, particular problem here in Calgary. I think this is going to start to dawn on other countries around the world. I'm picking it up when I visit the, the uh, Koreans. I'm uh, picking it up from, uh, from uh, other countries in Asia. Job loss. There are real concerns about whether or not innovation is going to lead to job loss. Number five, success breeds risk aversion. Synovus taught me this. I remember sitting down with the senior guys in Synovus, and I said, so tell me about, like, where is the most receptive place for digital in your company? And they said, they said the mistake all of you, techn you vendors, he's looking at me, the mistake you guys make is you constantly go to the biggest and most successful companies and try and persuade them that you've got a better idea. No, 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 no. Go to the companies that are failing. They've got a trigger event. Their minds are open. They're ready to try something different. Because if they don't, it's terminal. Right? Success breeds risk aversion. So go to the companies that are really, really struggling. More success. And then finally, number six, sixth biggest issue I, I've picked up is taking too narrow a scope. Many, many companies say, well, I'll try a little machine learning. So they put machine learning into this business unit, give it a go, it doesn't quite pan out, so they ban it. A different way to think about this is, again, back to the Tesla model, or NAL here in Calgary have done the same thing. They said, let's bolt bots together with blockchain and see what we get. Now they've started looking at a process from end to end. You combine technologies, create a bigger scope, bigger things happen. Why this is such a problem in oil and gas is because we stove pipe people into their buckets and their departments and they don't talk to one another, the silos and so forth. The silo structure of our companies is a huge barrier to, to change. Now, let me give you some thoughts around how you might want to confront uh, change management on your digital project, bearing in mind that th the world is, a, 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 is changing rapidly. Here are the five biz uh, three business motivators that I see over and over again. Cold business logic. What, are, what motivates business? Growth. Grow. Now, if you bolt those two together, you'll get growth. All of us are motivated by growth. Build the business. Capture new markets. Raise that stock price. Get, just get market price up. Prove our profits. Raise our production. These are all the signposts of growth. And we're all motivated by this, very inspired by this, and people want to do this. But what else motivates us in business? Risk. Risk. What is risk? Risk shows up in insurance, controls, auditing, checking, losses, competition. We're all okay for growth, but we have a big issue with risk. We want to manage the risk down. Here's an interesting statistic for you. When I was living and working in Australia, an outfit called um, Access Economics uh, did a t uh, research into the uh, Australian economy. They discovered that 25%, think about this, 25% of the total employment in Australia is dedicated to the task of risk. Checking, reviewing, auditing, counting, double counting, disputing, agreeing, da 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 da. 25% of the entire economy tied up in this bureaucratic process. And you might think, oh, well, that was the government just imposed all that. No, actually it wasn't. About 20% of, of that number was government imposed. 80% was company imposed. 80%. I can't, no, I've, I've worked in both countries. I gotta tell you, not a lot of difference between Canada and Australia. It's a pretty good chance many of our companies are w laboring under a layer of quality control and checking and review and so forth. 
that is here to manage risk. Common problem. And then bra, nd, bra, nd. Now, if you build that together, it's brand, brand, reputation. Businesses are highly motivated to protect their brand. You can only see what happens when we get pipeline branding wrong, is you can't get new, new pipelines built. Well, guess what? There are three parallel human, what I call hot emotions, that are the exact match, the exact match. So if you're into change management in a company, you gotta be thinking about two things. This cold business logic, selling a good idea, and then when you get into implementing it, you gotta deal with these hot human emotions. The exact opposite to growth is greed. Greed. People are highly motivated by greed. I'm very greedy. I mean, I, mean I, I read a book, wrote a book, so I'm big onto words. I don't like this word because it carries some baggage, but it's a pretty good word. It, it, it describes me in, in pretty good terms. I want the promotion. I like the bigger office. I wanted free parking. I like to buy a lifestyle. I want to finance my retirement. I want to buy toys. I want to go on nice vacations. I want to wear nice clothes. What drives that? Human greed. Human greed. What's the one that's a match to risk? Fear. Fear. What's, what's inside fear? Risk, fear, fear of failure. Fear, I'm going to lose my job. Fear that I'm not going to make that bonus. Fear that I'm not going to have status in my workplace, where I used to be the, 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 the top uh, person in my, in my field. Now I'm, now I'm second or third. Fear that I won't get that nice retirement that I'm looking for. All those years of saving, not going to go anywhere. When you're implementing change in companies, many of the people on the far side of that change, where you're, you're here saying, hey, I just want you to just try this process. What's driving them? Fear. Can they keep up? And what's last on, what's the, the parallel to brand? Parallel to brand? Pride. Pride. And I don't mean the movement. I mean just straight up human pride. Dignity. Respect. Respect for my values. Making me feel relevant to my business, to the business. Those are the drivers that, uh, that are really driving humans when we deal with them with change. And it's one thing when you say to a plant, we're going to shut the plant down or we're going to go lights out. It's quite another when you sit down with a sophisticated, highly educated engineer with a PhD and start talking about bots working in their job. Doesn't matter whether they're on the front line in the plant or if they're in the corporate head office with a lot of degrees. Hot human emotions are working. Hot human emotions. So when you drive change in companies, this is what I'm watching happen in the digital world is, is all around the world. The change, successful change leaders are the ones that keep an eye on both of those lines, both of those motivators. Give you an idea, just an example of this is how to train your bot. So the bot is over here. I don't know if you, if, some people get this joke is lost on people. Do you see the inbox for the bot is really low and he's, all the work is on the outside, but not for the human? Okay, all right, got the joke. So NAL. Training bots. Anybody here from NAL before I start uh, revealing trade secrets of any kind? No? So I'm allowed to talk to you about this um, uh, because uh, they've appeared on my podcast to share some of the stories. So any, NAL said, hey, um, bots, if it's banned on LinkedIn, it's good for us. So they brought the bot into the company and began running some, uh, some, some work to get it done. So the, the, the bot manager said, okay, let's uh, find a place where a bot could make some value for us, and they identified a, a good spot, and uh, they began to put the, the, the programmers to develop the bot capabilities. And then they ran the bot, and then they took it into the business and said, hey, look at what we accomplished. Okay, business case was very compelling. 95% productivity improvement. A process that took a human 800 seconds to do, in this case a contract review, the bot could do in 45 seconds. And by the way, they slowed the bot down so you could actually see it working. Because it was moving so fast, no one believed it was possible. But the bot was doing the job. Okay? Technology is so powerful, it's banned. What happened to the, what, which employee emotions kicked in here? Which of them said, oh, this is a growth opportunity? Show of hands, if you'd said, oh, yeah, I'm going to grow. Especially if you're the contract administrator, right? No, 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 no. This was fear, fear. So the, the proposition to the business was uh, very, very clear economically to the employees, absolutely not clear at all. So the employees said, we don't believe it. Pick another one. In fact, we'll pick the process for the bot to work on. Not you guys. You sandbag this this uh, puppy. We're gonna we'll pick the we'll pick the area. So they picked picked battery balancing, 
very complex area. Team went to work. 90 days later, back with the bot. 800 seconds for a human, 45 seconds for a bot. Same effect. Now the employees are like, ooh, this doesn't look so good. If you're trying to sell that technology into NAL now, what are you, what are you dealing with? You've just spooked the entire workforce. You've just taken privileged, white collar, financial accounting, land management uh, professionals, and you've just said, you're botifiable. You just injected an inoculation virus into the company that assures you that you will not have success rolling this technology up. So, that's what you're up against. This technology, when it works, when it works, it's very powerful, banned on social media platforms, just as an example. And I could talk about Internet of Things. I could talk about cloud computing. I could talk about machine learning. I could talk about blockchain. Any of these technologies, same story over and over and over again. So what are some things that you need to do? We need new ways of working. I'm going to just walk through just a handful of, of examples of what I mean by, by, uh, by new ways of working. What did NAL learn through all of this? Well, one is that they had to iterate. So when they sat down with the bot, the, the people who were like knew the job and then they developed the bot, what they discovered was the first time they did it, they got it wrong. So they had to work the bot to make it smarter. And then they ran it again, still didn't work. I don't know how many iterations they went through, but Corey Berg and crew will tell you 30, 40 trials to get it right. How many oil and gas companies will stick with a process like that through 30 trials to get it right? Ain't going to happen in our, in our culture. We get three shots and you're out. 30, 40, 50 trials. Iteration, trial and error. Fast. It's got to be fast. Everyone's got to be on board. I work with Aero Energy in Australia just to tell you a little story about, about how this, uh, uh, the new way of working they came up with. They came up with the idea of why don't we manufacture wells instead of just drilling every individual well? This is a coal seam gas operation. And so they had put a technology in place that allowed them to create a manufacturing way of delivering these wells. And um, the finance team said, that's all well and good, but we didn't sign up to be uh, in a factory. We signed up to do finance. And they said, not in the finance department. So a, pro a tool that was so productive, it made the, uh, the uh, drilling team go from one well per week to seven wells per week, right? Sevenfold productivity. Finance said, talk to the hand. We never signed up for that. Need new ways of working. By the way, this stuff favors youth, young people. They're all over this, right? This is the game world. This is, this is their world. So if you're not bringing young people into thinking through how you might uh, transform your uh, business, uh, you're, you're uh, fighting a, a, a fire, uh, game with uh, one hand tied behind your back. All right, here's a few things that I've picked up that others do really, really well. Number one is they control the narrative. You have to paint a vision of the future as so why you're putting these technologies in place. In the NAL case, if they said to the employees, we're going to make you more productive, eh, most employees now get that message that says, more work for a few, far fewer people. Productivity doesn't sell. What did they say? This is about growth. If we can get our costs reset so that we are more productive than the rest, we're going to go buying assets and put them onto our platform. They turn the narrative into a growth platform, That really a growth narrative. That's what helped the uh, impacted um, get, on, get on board. Number two, set yourself up for suck. That should read success. So set yourself up for success. Number one challenge of this, this is an education and an awareness problem. Unless you get an army of people behind you driving this, uh, it's not one person can't, can't, just can't steer this. So this is about education and awareness. Um, benchmarking is a really good tool. The Koreans, deeply interested in benchmarking. That's why they asked me to come down to, uh, to, to spend time with them. They want to know what's going on up here. Uh, another key, don't delegate this to your startups or to your tech vendors. It's a bad idea. Uh, the reason for that is that they lack the insight and awareness of politically how to drive change through your organization. Don't delegate this to a, uh, to a tech startup. Next one, execute with agility. A couple of thoughts here. If there's opportunity, if you look at your business problem space and you go, you know what, our biggest problem is up in the field. We can't seem to hire people because the work processes are too complex and it takes too long to train people. That might be the place where you go and aim your digital uh, in interest. Move your development team to the site. Magic happens. I'm watching it happen over and over and over again. A 22-year-old 
young engineer, fresh out of school with coding skills, can do some extraordinary things in the eyes of your people in the field. Take the development team up to the field. For those of you who are in management, though, you need to institute a get out of jail card policy. Because in NAL's case, that bot fell over 20, 30, 40 times before they got it right. Where was the CFO making sure that the finance folks weren't going to go into jail because the financial results were delayed? He got them all a get out of jail card. You got to get a got to get out of jail card. You got to stand up and and, uh, and and make sure your people know that they're supported. Third lesson from uh, NAL: got to line up IT and OT. IT, SAP folks, commercial systems, so forth. OT, SCADA systems, field networks, telecommunications. And the reason for that is the next generation of tools coming at us: bots, robots, drones, automated equipment doesn't give a crap about whether you're dealing with data that comes from OT or data that comes out of IT. But if you keep those in two solitudes, you have real challenges trying to mesh together uh, this future world. So the leaders out there are figuring out quickly, how do I align um, IT and OT? Last but not least, share the successes no matter how small. Uh, NEL would champion the smallest of things. We got the bot to run once. Ooh, that was victory because they knew it was going to be a long road. So share your successes no matter how small and uh, uh, keep a, a, a clear eye on, uh, on, that, on that prize. Now, this is what the, I want to conclude with just this one thought. Uh, you don't want to be this guy. I've been asked to find a bold and innovative solution to do exactly what we've done for the last 25 years. Doesn't work. In the digital world, this is about reinvention and rethinking and change. And the biggest challenge is how do you bring your people along for the journey? Now, let me give you some follow-up ideas uh, really, really quickly. If you're interested, um, subscribe to my, uh, my weekly blog series. I do uh, comment on all manner of topics that are relevant to the industry. Uh, I get into geopolitics and cyber issues and talent and blockchain and so forth. Uh, pick up the book. Um, it's eight bucks, like it's two cups of coffee. It's not that expensive, but it, uh, that's the ebook version. Uh, it's also available in audio format if you're driving long distances and you need um, uh, 10 and a half hours precisely of uh, audio, uh, you can speed it up. Uh, the voice is uh, Paul Boucher. Uh, when you hear him, it's, he's redid the recording. When you hear him, you go, I know that voice. It's because he does all these commercials on TV. I had no idea. I'm sitting in my living room going, hey, wait a minute. Is that guy reading my book? Now he's selling to Tostitos or something. <laughs> this appears on television. So read the book or download the audio version. Um, I do have a digital seminar kind of like this where I walk people through uh, what this might mean for a specific business. Uh, and of course, um, like a good consultant, I do coaching and advising and uh, so forth. And uh, that's how you might reach me at, uh, at my email address. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.